All right, ladies and gentlemen, fellow decoder, fellow historian, fellow chronologist, whatever you are, syncretist, the whole kit and caboodle today, I am once again joined by the great Jason Bashirs from Archaics. And oh boy, what a dandy of a topic we have. I know a lot of you are, have, are waiting for this one. Um, as soon as I put it out, uh coming soon i had a lot of activity on my uh, my channel and uh, a lot of people talking about this topic um and so i'm really 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 grateful that jason was uh, agreeing to join up and talk about this i couldn't think of a better person really to kind of discuss this information i do have some questions that i've written down um some things that i was kind of going over that maybe sparks some interest of what your take is on everything. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, I want to just start off by telling all of you the very reason why I came up with this idea. Uh, it was about three, four weeks ago, maybe now, and I was thinking of um, doing a podcast with Jason and then just I was I had this this alien thing on my mind aliens on my mind and I was I was researching not just aliens from the typical outer space far away from here but the the stories of the underground aliens and you know it was so crazy because then I ended up just going on your channel Jason and you were there you were talking about it and I was like okay well this was a synchronicity that I don't want to miss this opportunity so I reached out I sent him a voicemail he didn't get it sent him an email said hey let's do a podcast can we do it on underground aliens you're like yeah that's a hot topic let's do it and so here we are here we are and um dude I'm I'm so ready to tackle this topic with you man um and i'm just gonna throw it at you right now underground aliens what's your take on it man underground extraterrestrials where, where do you go with this okay well i mean first of all i'm 100 on board with the fact that we have a breakaway civilization that's been existing in our underworld for a very long period of time and there are many, many libraries that have been destroyed throughout world history that we don't have that we don't have all the data anymore. But enough has survived from the ancient world that we have these fragments about Shambhala. We have these fragments about Agartha, about underground kingdoms. We have all these traditions and folklore that little green elves would come up in the forest in the evening time, kidnap little children and vanish into these fairy rings. And there, and it was uh, by all accounts. Even in the middle of the dark ages to the middle to the to the uh, mid medieval period, it was always underground into the side of hills. It was these strange lights that would appear in the forest and children would go out to and investigate. They'd never come back. They, they would they would vanish and disappear. And legends were created like the Pied Piper of, of Hamlin, which contrary to popular belief was not an isolated incident incident there wasn't one piper and there wasn't one incident at, at hamlin this was a phenomenon that had been documented for centuries and this is what it this is what it became in the folklore the pied piper but actually there were many incidents like that so we do have human abduction phenomenon it goes back to extreme antiquity we have the idea that humans on the surface are disappearing and they're going somewhere I mean, we in the modern times we have we have the 411 cases. We have the the national parks. Uh, we got the Devil's Triangle off the Sea of Japan, where whole ships have been found derelict. All the food left on the tables. All the life rafts still on deck. No, not a single person on board. Same thing we found with the Mary Celeste. The same thing we found with many derelict ships in the 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s. Even even as as recent as 1910s, whole ships from Sweden with all 300 cadets, all young boys, just totally vanish. It's, it doesn't make any sense. There is something happening. Yeah. You, well, know, you mentioned I, something on the 411. What, what was that you mentioned? 411? Yeah, there's a, there's a phenomenon going on with, with uh, America's national parks right now where people are documenting all the massive amounts of human abductions that have just vanished. People have vanished just going into the interior of these national parks. So what's the what is the 411? related to is that just like uh, for the information or yeah yeah information it's like uh, it's what they're calling themselves 411 investigators uh but uh yeah it's 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 really weird it's some weird stuff but there are people disappearing no matter what the cover story is uh, i don't believe the national parks really have much of a play uh, play in it i believe it's all going underground 
Uh, this is something I would like to discuss, the whole the whole alien abduction thing. All the evidence points to underground, not space, not space aliens, not intruders from, from outer space, and none of that. That seems to be a very clever, covert misinformation campaign. Wow. It's so fascinating because the, I, I, the 411 triggered me because I'm going to ask and we're going to talk about the locusts that are discussed in the book of Revelation. So those of you that are fans of theology, we're going to be discussing Revelation chapter 9, I think it's verse 3, where it talks about the bottomless pit being opened up and, this, and the locusts come out. And it's so fascinating, Jason, because in St. Louis, Missouri, there's the Federal Reserve Bank. And you know what the address is? 411 Locust Street. Isn't that interesting? Wow. <laughs> Damn, are you serious? 411 Locust Street. dude. 411 Locust Street is the Federal Reserve of, of St. Louis. And I know that because my social security number on the back of it is 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 typed to that. Like if you look at your social security card and you look at the number on the back, it'll tell you what Federal Reserve Bank you belong to. Well, lo the the symbol locust in the Old Testament narrative is a symbol for something that embodies the concept of destroyer of the harvest. And in the Old Testament, the crop, the harvest, uh, is actual actual humanity. And humanity is divided between the wheat and the chafe. Yep. Yep. For sure. And that's that's that was again, that was what promulgated me to contact you and discuss and come up with this topic. And I know this is going to be a, I know there's a lot of people are going to watch this one, the underground aliens. And so like, I was, I was just like perusing YouTube, uh, hours ago to get some kind of some more, maybe questions that we could talk about. And it, and on the history channel, I think they had, or some, one of the channels that you were talking about the aliens and they mentioned that they, they could be leaving earth, not coming to it. And that's where these UFO phenomenons are coming from. They're actually leaving or trying to leave or whatever It's really yep. fascinating. It, it's history channel is something else because it's anything but it's now co-opted yeah. it's now co-opted into the ancient aliens narrative and these guys have way too much momentum to not be backed by something that is beyond beyond commercial ability and what i what i mean is 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 the ancient aliens narrative is something that the government would definitely want to foster and they would want to foster it because it is quite evident that a black ops program began 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 in the 1930s and it really built momentum in the 1940s this 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 involved uh close encounters of the fourth kind this is actual human disappearances human alien abduction deals so when this phenomenon uh uh, began to unfold is very well documented by people like David Jake Jacobs, The Threat, uh, the book by Raymond D. Fowler, The Watchers. Both of these books are huge and they're very well documented of all the people who have claimed to be uh, abducted by aliens. But the cracks, the cracks in the facade are very noticeable. Many researchers have noted that some of these people actually see other things uh, when they go through hypnotic regression and 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 their the uh, testimony under hypnosis reveals more details showing there's been a mind wipe showing that there were actual individuals in costumes around them while they were medicated and sedated and their memories are of aliens and green little men and all that but sometimes people see beyond the immediate which is well illuminated and they can see further into the shadowed area but nobody cares because they think they're unconscious or sedated or paralyzed but these people see and remember and they see doctors in white lab coats and they see like g-men in black suits uh, in the back, right in the same room with the aliens that are doing these these implant operations and all that. This is so widely documented and mentioned by so many different people that it can't be a figment of their imagination. Are you talking about these, you're talking about hypnotic re uh, regression. Yes, the, yeah, the people that have seen these little glimpses that, that that's telling them that this isn't real. These aren't really aliens. These are people in costumes doing this bullshit. And well, this is exactly what a what a black ops operation would do. 
If you're going, if you have an agenda that cannot be legalized, you can't get proper funding through the natural channels and you have to, you have to hide and conceal what you're doing from your own government, then different black ops groups would also have to have an intelligence apparatus in place to throw off mis misinformation, to throw misinformation out there and to muddle the waters. And what better way to hide a human abduction program sending innocent people to facilities in the underworld to undergo surgeries and implants and tests and blood transfusions and all kinds and the extraction of fetal material and fetuses and then send them back up with altered memories under sedation uh, making it making if they did remember anything they would remember aliens little green people but those are just humans in suits this misinformation while you're doing that while you're doing that you're also supporting those social media and cinema producers that are putting out these narratives of aliens from outer space and all that so it's a two pro it's a two-pronged cover story i don't believe for a second that the ancient aliens franchise is is making enough money to do what they do travel all over the world do all these things no they're being financed because it's necessary for for those black ops organizations to cover their track and the best way is is to have the general public believe that ets are among us doing these things when it's actually a breakaway civilization it is it is another human civilization in our underworld doing these activities for whatever reason well, let's talk about that because you know that that's interesting. Um, I, I I'm actually working on a decode uh, for Area 51. I know that you and I we've talked about that, and yeah. you. I think I I don't remember, so you'd have to correct me if I'm incorrect on what what you had said. But I thought you had said you don't think that anything's going on there. You think it was just just a big facade and a big circus. Well, thing. well, let me so, something did go go on. It's called it's called misinformation delivered. Let me explain in a nutshell what happened real fast in 1947. Okay. All right. The alien UFO crashes and the bodies that were retrieved were 100% intentionally staged. Oppenheimer was there and he was waiting on it. He was already in position. He was there on site. When the people reported it, he and the military convoys went in there and they scooped up all these pieces and all that. And they made a real big deal of sending a convoy to uh, Area 51. So... Oh, they sent a convoy to Area 51, but at the same time, another convoy went to Wright Patterson Airfield to to the uh, advanced to the advanced materials. And it's it's an Air Force base that has a secret underground area. It's not so secret today, but it's got military labs in what there. What in Ohio, right? Yeah, where they where they enter. It's basically where they retro engineer any foreign materials to find out how they were made or or how they were manufactured. So these materials were, were sent there. Now we're told that this was an alien assist, meaning that the UFOs were crashed intentionally, but they weren't UFOs. These are these were technologically advanced materials from a breakaway civilization in our underworld. They were staged to make it look like a UFO crash. U.S. military was even told the site where they would be staged. They're already on location with Oppenheimer to go scoop it up. They scoop it up and they send, send a convoy to Area 51, ultimately to Hangar 18, which never housed anything. The real materials were sent to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and there's several books about about this topic and about how secret this facility used to be. It's not so secret now, but uh, this is where they developed titanium and Velcro and all these things that that they got from this supposed alien assist. Now, the whole idea, though, was to get the general public to finally believe that there is a conspiracy and that the government and military are trying to hide the existence of aliens. This was the reverse psychology method that was used by military intelligence. They wanted the public to realize that, oh, there is a secret. They're just not going to tell us that. So UFOs and aliens must be real. So as long as the public will always entertain that idea, they'll never search deeper to figure out what's really going on that genetic materials are being used by a breakaway civilization in our underworld that's been there for a very long time and they have been genetically tampering with us for a very long period of time and yeah. they agreed to provide technological knowledge material and materials in exchange for the allowance of the abduction of humans for mm -hmm. a period of time 
I don't know how long that period of time is, but uh, but I think it was supposed to be for a 70 year period, but I'm not sure. Right. So let me ask you the uh, the uh, you said Oppenheimer was there. Like with this was this information that you read in a book or I would yes. have because you read a lot of stuff, right? So what what reference do you have that he was actually there at the you're talking about the Roswell crash in 47, right? Yes, the Roswell, the Roswell crash in 47. It was actually yes, in Corona. It was in Corona, right? It was actually in Corona. Well, it was yeah, it was nearby. Yeah, it was nearby. nearby. Corona, was, yeah, Cor and we have the Corona and the sun and all that stuff. It's just so funny, right? But um, you know, see, the Nazi the scientists after 1946 and Nuremberg trials, the not the Nazi scientists that were not executed and that signed the contract with the United States to go ahead and use their scientific expertise in, in the American military uh, branches, well, they were brought to Texas. And in Texas, they were debriefed. And in Texas, they were given new identities. They were given new, they were given basically a whole new lives. They were allowed to bring their families over. And, and many of them were relocated to El Paso and then New Mexico. And these scientists worked on multiple different projects. And many of them later ended up in 1957 in the NASA projects. Yeah. But the, this, this was NASA, the NASA projects were 10 years after this supposed staged uh, alien assist. And, and, and these deals right here. Now, the material that you want, I could definitely find it for you. I'm not going to be able to find just, it for yeah, you. Yeah, no, I was just in the middle just, in the middle of this in the middle of this video. No, no, but, no, no. I was I would I would imagine. I, I mean, look, I mean, uh, you're referencing material that you found and all that kind of stuff. I just think it's so fascinating that Roswell and Corona in New Mexico are you know on that 33, 34 degree parallel latitude, and you know how big how big I am on the ley line and the numbers and whatnot and all that. But and then you just go north a little bit and you're talking about getting into the Los Alamos laboratory and uh, mm -hmm. and this area, Las Cruces. And this is where all these underground tunnels through into Colorado. And now you're going to get into the, the Denver airport and all that stuff and the connection possibly of this. And then we get into the underground stuff. It just it, it's oh, yeah, so, you also you, so connected. you're also you're correct. Also, White Sands missile bases. White in Sands, that area. Yeah. yeah, it's there, too. Yeah. And then you go into Nevada and you get the Silver State <laughs> and you get Area 51, which is called Paradise Ranch. It's just so if I like those people that follow my research as I'm big into numerology, Paradise Ranch and numerology is 41. Um, Elohim is 41. And then you have Moscovium, which is the element that Bob Lazar said is the UFO pro the propellant for spacecraft uh, is the 115th element. And it's just so fascinating that the longitude of Area 51 is 115 degrees west. And that's yeah. the protons for Moscovium, which is supposedly the element to make UFO propulsion happen. It's just and I is what I have in coming out my Area 51. 51 is the mirror of 15. Alien is 15. Mm -hmm it's just so it's just it's just so right there right but let's well I, I agree that ufos exist there's no doubt there's no doubt oh, in my for mind. sure they even, do. Yeah, even the flying sure. saucers exist yep. my only point of contention is every bit of this is terrestrial not extraterrestrial right 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 it's actually right. subterrestrial right and that all of this is misinformation i believe we live in a construct i believe there's no escape i believe we're here Yep. And this is why NASA NASA is so necessary because it keeps the public believing in the idea that we have get the, out. Yeah. that we have the freedom to live a Star Trek life yeah. when or, actually we're right here. Yeah, or they're trying or they're trying to get out and they need people's attention through magic and they're using that to harness the energy and maybe that's maybe that's what they're trying that, to do. That's not off the table, you're right. Yeah, yeah, you're it's right. definitely possible. So, I, as I was researching today, uh I got into this underground cave they they discovered in 1990 in um, Vietnam, which I I'm sure you know about, which is called the San San Dong Cave, which is the largest cave in the world. Did you do you know yeah, about? Yeah, I've that? seen I've seen pictures of it. It's pretty fascinating. Impressive. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. This this cave, and there's a lot of stories that have come out of this, where there's been large reptilian you know humanoids that have you know, been seen and observed over the years coming in and out of those caves. Um, you know, like all these witnesses, I, I, I mean, I, I understand that there is these black ops things going on, you know, trying to get people to believe and whatever the reasons why they're trying to get these things to, to happen. But, uh, but you and I are in agreement that there's something going on underground. You get the Los Alamos laboratory, Las Cruces. I've, I've studied enough of Don, you must have studied Phil Donahue's testimonials where he's got his fingers melted off. And I mean, I don't know, like it's a good story, right? When he went underground, have you heard of his story? 
Well, yeah, I've I, I've re, I've read the I've read the secondhand accounts that describe Phil Donahue stuff, but I haven't read Phil Donahue. No. Well, Phil Schneider, Schneider. I'm sorry, Phil Schneider. Yeah, I think it's okay. Schneider. Yeah, Phil Schneider. But he says yeah, he yeah, Schneider's the one that had his hand damaged. Yeah, he went underground and he was met by a right. very smelly <laughs> alien, whatever it was, and it just literally burned his fingers off. Yeah, I, I you know, somebody else had mentioned uh, Phil Schneider with when I was with doing a podcast with Matt. And I, I'd, I'd admitted in that video too that Matt was an expert on Phil Schneider. I'm not. I just hear, I just hear things about him from Matt. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm no, I'm no expert either. I'm just an observer of, of these people and, and all these. But I know, I personally, the thing for me is like I personally know people that have been abducted. Like they all have their own stories, and it's all obviously it's there's very sim, there's a lot of similarities. But I personally, right. and what am I going to tell them? Like you're full of shit. Like you're not, you're lying. You're not right. speaking the truth, right? So there's something to this, but then you get into, and the big topic here is, is this underground alien. And are, do you think that the time, like, I think 2024, I've kind of got it pegged. I think next year is going to be a very, very big, Jordan and I just did a podcast from Waters Above, and we both agree that we think 2024 is going to be a very, very big year of some kind of release of information, some things that will be disclosed, et cetera, et cetera. And it kind of just makes sense with the numbers from a decoder perspective, myself looking into this kind of stuff. What's your take on that? Do you have anything on the timelines with your chronology and history repeating itself and stuff like that? I, I have done, I've been so busy just on historical stuff and, and doing podcasts and, and working on my case.tv. I've been doing, I've been so busy that I haven't done any predictions videos in a while. And ever since my, my discovery about three months ago on wave diffusion mechanics and, and mm. how I was, I should have applied that to my predictions videos and did not, uh, I kind of want to redo a bunch of my predictions. I just haven't had time to sit down because it's very time consuming, the things I have to analyze, but, uh, this, uh, like a pool of water, the ripples that go out, yep. the, 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 the past events of those ripples are commiserate with the future ones. And I've shown many, many times on my channel how this patterning works isometrically. It's in, it's in the four events are structured in palindromes. However, it also follows the physics of the pool of water. Once you get a certain amount of rings, the outer rings begin to diffuse and flatten and spread out. And so do the events. It was actually somebody else who brought this to my attention. It was, it, it blew my mind that I had not seen this before, but this is why I'm glad that I so freely share my research and my findings with people because other people are able to pick up the torch yeah. and see things that I didn't see. So yeah, I'm about to do some more predictions videos, but now I'm going to do it with this new understanding that epicentral years only hold that power and structuring for a certain amount of time. Then you got to find another epicentral year to base all your predictions off of. Yeah. I haven't even I haven't even looked at 2024, but I can tell you right now that there's going to be significant events that unfolded in 1972 that mirror things are going to happen next year in 1970 uh, i mean 2024 i don't know to what degree but there will be a lot of associations there always are so interesting just, uh, just like 1973 and 2023 ha have many parallels and associations yeah. and uh this this goes back all the way to the last epicentral year which was 1998 the problem is this far away from the epicentral year of 1998 the wave diffusion kicks in and some events predicted for 2021 and 2022 won't unfold in, or haven't unfolded until this year and some things that some people believe won't happen until later 2023 and 2024 probably won't happen until 25 25 or 26 because right. this this diffusion is very very real Right. So, so this is interesting. I know I don't want to get too much off topic. This, so this wave diffusion, <clears throat> you know, I study a lot of physics, uh, sound frequency vibration, and a lot of it relates and correlates to the wave, you know? Um, and I think the wave is really all that makes up this entire reality through sound and light. Um, but then you get into the, are, are you, are you actually tapping into the like double slit experiment and photons and stuff like that with your research with the wave? No, no, I'm not actually, actually everything can be, reduced to its lowest common denominators, which are, which is numerics. So arithmetic is, is, is and geometry is the, basically the only things I use for prediction analysis, other than the dates of the events themselves, because dates are actually coordinate. When you grid something out, a date isn't even a date, it's a coordinate. Right. So 
Right. So, how, yeah. how about signing cosine waves in trigonometry? Are you using are you using those measurements? Oh, I have an Ophus program that does does apply that. Those predictions are for are for very short term short term things that involve multiple different factors, such as uh, such as uh, a whole team playing another team. There's a lot of dy dynamics involved, so you need to basically. It's a tremendous amount of algorithms that are that are applied that can be simplified by using the cosine. But I just don't I don't use them for predictions at all. Okay. All right. So let's you know i mean 2024 too i mean i'm big on on the, the calendar and 2024 is a leap year um and that's you know every four years that's a big deal the leap year 2024 you got the olympics in paris so a lot of big things going on next year 2024 um and that you know that kind of goes into this the the main topic here underground aliens and you know is it possible is it possible from your research and all the history you've studied that there's a reset we know the phoenix event there's these resets small big whatever um and i think we talked about this before but do you think that when these resets happen the technology goes underground and it stays underground until it's safe to come back up again and then it emerges and now you have some people that have very advanced technology because the society civilization kind of goes backwards and has to start over again. What's your, what's your take on that? The mud floods? Lo Logan, I'm absolutely convinced that many of the written materials that we have that resurfaced after 1764 were hidden in the underworld. Mm -hmm. And then 138 years later, when they expected a real hard reset, but only received a soft reset in 1902, Again, they unleash their libraries. This is very common. Anybody can Google these things and see just how many libraries appeared in the world in 1902, 1903, no and kidding. 1904. Not only that, but anyone can do a very simple search because I did it and I published it on my on my YouTube channel. But anybody can do a search on the Fortune 500 companies that exist today, and you will find that almost 90% of them existed in another form earlier in the 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s and ultimately almost every one of them came into existence in 1902. Wow, so 19 I mean maybe 1901 was the was the actual clearing of the board so to speak. Soft well it was it, an, an expected clearing of the board, but but nothing happened but three volcanoes and several earthquakes and red dust and red mud and red rain blanketed the entire world and there were fireballs that fell from the sky that were documented all over the world, but it wasn't a hard reset. There wasn't massive uh, loss of life. Only a th only three volcanic eruptions, and, that, and the total death toll was like fifty thousand people. That's not bad at all sure. uh, for a worldwide event. The only thing that that really showed that the Phoenix phenomenon was on schedule was the worldwide uh, red rains, red dust, red mud, and uh, 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 just just really really weird red material that rained all over the world. You know, same thing happened in 1764, 138 years earlier. You already know it's the Phoenix phenomenon. Yep. Uh, you, you've seen this on my channel a lot, but I agree there. They know the schedule and they hide in the underworld. They have their facilities. These facilities are ancient. They're old. It's a, and I believe they keep these libraries down there. They keep these innovations. They keep, um, I mean, it's so weird after, after these Phoenix years, how these major inventions that have changed the world suddenly are introduced. Like 1902, 1902, air conditioning, all of a sudden. 1902, there's so many inventions right. that, just, that were just thrown into the into the world. Uh, uh, fluorescent lighting, uh, 1903, Harley-Davidson motorcycles. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm really not doing it service, even trying to name any right now. I have a video that names like over 60 of them. And wow. it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense unless all these things pre-existed right. and then and then they were brought back up when it was when it was noticed that the coast was clear that's so fascinating so you you get it so i'm on board with that i mean i thought that kind of makes a lot of sense um i mean you know the the whole like i've i've i'm a i'm a big researcher into pluto hades 
Prometheus, which I've done decodes on. Pluto comes from the Greek word Plutos, which means the riches of the earth, the treasures of the earth, which is the underground. And the mm -hmm. soil and the agriculture is what feeds the underground and the underworld, et cetera, et cetera, which kind of keeps this whole ecosystem in check and in balance. The sun having a kind of a contract, if you will, with the earth and forming the photosynthesis and all that kind of stuff. Well, let's talk a little bit more about this this underground alien topic here and i've been watching a heck of a lot of content from like movies like i just watched a movie the other day someone suggested it which i kind of did a decode on maybe you've seen it called the cabin in the woods i think it was done in 2012 or something like that it starred chris hemsworth who played thor and a few other big character names in some of the big hollywood movies and that whole movie was about basically th this reality was f a food source for what they called the ancient ones and they were underground and the only way that they wouldn't come up is by getting fed right and then you would obviously postulate the ideas of where people are getting abducted going underground and god knows what happens down there i mean definitely implants i would imagine are are very common for people that do get abducted right i mean if you if you're, if you're somebody who's listening to this and you got abducted you you may have an implant in your body you how would you ever know, really? What would your take on that? Do you think people get implants and, and, and uh, are well, being tracked and monitored? You know what? I've got to. I, you know what? I got to look on this because there's a book called The Aliens in the Scalpel. I'm Googling this right now uh -huh. so, I can, so I can give you this guy's name. Okay. But I, after reading this book, which, was, which my publisher, Paul Tysa of Booktree in San Diego, recommended this book. And he sent it to me. He says, you got to check this book out because I know this man personally. He's a doctor and he, uh, they're talking about taking his medical license. Uh, he is he has already given about 3000 lectures and he has proven on camera to remove alien alien like uh, people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. And they say that they know they got a chip inside of them. He goes in there and extracts it. He finds them and he, and he found out, he photographed them. He found out some amazing things. One, they're biomechanical and they try to get away from the scalpel blade. They move under the skin. Really? So they're alive. Yes. They're like a parasite, but they're not, they're computerized and they're protected. Once he, once he breaks away the little biomechanical suit that they have that they can move in, it's a capsule that's protected in some bio sack. And this is, he, he destroyed several before he figured it out. But when he cuts the bio sack off uh, under a camera and he films it all, when he cuts the bio sack off, the implant on the side is technological. It's got little wires and stuff, but it instantly disintegrates on contact with air. So he learned how to open up these bio sacs by inside a container that is full of the person's blood. As long as it's water mixed with their blood, the bio sac doesn't self-destruct. And he's able to open it, peel it all out and pull it out, pull it out. And it's some type of micro circuitry. It's technological. technological. It's not alive. It's not a real parasite. It's technologically advanced. And it's something that's probably not beyond our ability today to manufacture. So he's found these. They, they, uh, I don't know what his name is. Dr. Steven something. I'm going to tell you right now. The book is called Aliens and the Scalpel. That's an interesting topic. <laughs> I'll have to. Uh, I think I'm going to probably check that out. That sounds like a his book is fantastic. What, when it was is. it written? How, how old is it? I'm about to tell you right now. I'm about to show it to you right now. This is the book. Rod oh, Dr. Roger Lear. Yeah, this Roger man Lear. This man has put his life on the line to, to reveal this stuff. Because uh, a, lot, a lot of people have come to him. A lot of people have come to him. I'm going to see if you can see this. Yeah, let's see if we can. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. The Aliens and the Scalpel. Revised. Oh, it's a second edition. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I'll yeah, make sure Dr. I add that in the description. I, I wrote it down. Yeah, that's Dr. Roger Lear. And yeah, man, he's he I mean he's faced a hell of a lot of criticism by by coming out on this. And oh uh, he still he alive? Remove, he, he remo yeah, he's still alive. He removes these things from people's bodies and shows on camera and shows people you're not tripping. Your memories are probably very true because something put this in your body it does not belong and so it is it's, it's so crazy 
because I mean, I'm a huge fan of the sh movie uh, called The Manchurian Candidate. And it was done in 1962, starring Frank Sinatra and company. And then Denzel Washington and Lee Schreiber redid it in 2004. And it was all about an implant in the brain and then them being programmed by certain circumstances that never really happened. They were all staged. And then they all kind of revisited that throughout the rest of their lives. And this was all military, of course. And they, it was all about mind control and then being this guy being put in, winning the, the Purple Star and then being put in as vice president. And then they wanted him to be president. And it was all about kind of the Red Queen and her direct. It was just, it's a very fascinating movie. You haven't seen it, the Manchurian Candidate, but that was what it was all about that. So I, I'm, I'm just, I'm really big into, uh, you know, the, these whole kinds of ideas. And then you get into this underground thing. So I guess, you know, the elephants in the room, like underground aliens, you believe they exist or and at least underground entities exist um how long do you think they've been there well I, i'm gonna i'm gonna add a new twist to this whole line of reasoning real quick just just entertain it for a second yeah of All course right? okay i believe that we live in a technologically advanced construct and i and i and i am 100 percent of the belief now that we volunteered for this but any technologically advanced construct is going to need some stewards to make sure that the inhabitants have a real experience and, and that everything goes right. And what I mean is, what if, what if now something is making sure that our avatars are still performing optimally? Because you have to understand, there's a real mystery with the human experience. It's real easy to fall for the bullshit programming of scholastics when they try to tell us that we, we evolved from monkeys. But that totally dismisses many things that we know to be true, such as there are many things about blood types that are totally incompatible with one another. Blood types, these, these, these blood types that we have weren't naturally developed. These cosmetic changes in the human physiology are cosmetic, not, not the product of, of evolution. Those who have really studied the human body understand that there are things that do not make sense and comport with natural selection or evolution, especially our hair. Things, it seems like the human was built for aesthetics and that we weren't built as, an, as, the, as the fulfillment of a long period of evolutionary development. And this is a problem. These RH negative people and these and these type O negatives and AB positive and the, the differences, what it creates, the, the psychoses it creates sometimes when people of different blood types get together and how and how certain blood types just can't get along with each other uh, biologically. This these things we are made. It's almost as if the Mayan Popol Vuh is telling us the truth that the gods manufactured each stage of humanity and when they didn't like a prior product they discarded it and then just started anew they didn't wipe it out and kill it they just left them on earth to do what they wanted and they started over with a whole new product and they made humans out of all new materials and started again so this is the story of that's that's preserved in the codex the mayan popol vu this is this is how they describe the reason why there's so many different people different types of people here but what if there are stewards here Logan, that cannot be known for being what they are. Therefore, they have a massive information campaign to make us believe in other things like fairies, like trolls, these, these, these gnomes that kidnap our young and our daughters. Uh, the sons of God came down to the daughters of men and took them and, and gave birth to giants and titans and mutants and heroes of the old. What if a lot of these stories that have been given to us were given to us so that we would believe these things other than finding out the real truth is that we're living in like a Hunger Games type atmosphere where things are very, very normal to us only because we believe by virtue of the central nervous system and we're processing all this information in our immediate environment. But the rest of the world is unknown to us except for what we hear from other people and what we see in the media and in and, and, and different media, whatever, however we get our information. But what if 
The underworld is populated with facilities that are making sure the construct is operating optimally. And they're not aliens, and they're not a breakaway civilization. They are humans from outside the construct that are working that are working just like you remember the Hunger Games movie? Of you course. remember the observer? You remember the observatory they had and they were able to they were able to use a keyboard to create real phenomena to those that were on the inside of the dome. You understand? But it was but it wasn't real phenomena. They were made to believe it was real and if they believed it it became real to them. And those who disbelieved the dangers were immune to them. Hmm. So this uh I'm just bouncing ideas off here. Yeah, no, what I, I, I love it. I love it. I mean, look, I've, I've, I've decoded so many different topics that correlate to this topic itself, underground aliens. It just, it, it has, you know, you have this topic of underground aliens and you can have all these subordinate categories underneath titles, movies, like, you know, big one, Westworld, the movie 1973, and that ends up moving into HBO and they have this massive series that was so popular about an implant in your brain and you're not in control of your reality now that goes into perhaps the aspect of and this is you know this is an idea ladies and gentlemen so i'm not saying it's true but what if what if the human being species has been cloned over and over and over and we have now have the human beings be the homo sapien at this point now the cro magnum man i mean these are all species and you know it's fascinating because i've got the blood types the eight known blood types uh i've got it pegged to japan and you know japan's flag is a white flag with a big red dot on it and of course they say it's the sun the land of the rising sun but that red dot is not yellow <laughs> you know it's red um and i got it pegged to japan and you know, I got a peg to the 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 element called Nihonium on the periodic table, and I don't want to go into all the big uh, details for people that really don't. I don't want to get too abstract, but you know, Japan ha has so much tie-ins to this man, uh, and the technology that they may possess over there. Uh, do you? What, what's your take on Japan? Have you done any research, what, like ancient stuff going back, the Phoenix event? What, what are your ties to Japan? What have you got on that? Oh. Well, I know the, the Japanese admit that long before the shogunate took power, that there was another race living on those islands well, when they showed up, and they called them the Ainu, uh, A-I-N-U, and these were a very tall white people, like a Caucasian right? people. Yeah, they're called the Ainu, and they lived in they lived in, in Kaipan long before long before the shogunate took power, long before the actual Japanese uh, uh, came from the mainland. Because the ja the Japanese weren't always there, and uh, it wasn't called Japan either. Where it was originally Kaipan, but uh, right. You know, I, it's a funny story to that because I believe that they changed the name to Japan, so because it would put the J would put them before the K on all the international lists after after they were entered into NATO. But uh, <laughs> okay. it was, it's crazy history. But yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I they, mean, they, it's, they, it's called Nihon, and I mean that's how you pronounce it in japanese nihon yeah i, ha I have the book nihon shoki uh -huh. the, the japanese uh, his calendar history it's dated to 583 bc i have a translation of, of that tradition but uh yeah nihon shoki is pretty interesting but this the i knew the i knew it were, were the this was the belief system way before the nihon shoki this was uh it was long before that but other than that i don't know much about japan they've been a very isolated civilization for a very long period of time sure sure so, Sure. So I don't All right. So, what what about going to? <laughs> if we go all the way back to ancient Samaria, right? Which I know you know a lot about. Uh, you know, a lot of my research right now has been leading me to Uranus, um, and you know, of course, sky. And when you what what I've found is that is directly linked to Anu, and the god of the sky and heaven and the father and. It's just so fascinating because the land of Ur, which starts with the letter U R, which is Uranus, is is all connected there. Um, what do you what do you what's your take on the underground entities and going all the way back to ancient Samaria, tying that into the Anunnaki, Anu, Enki, Enlil? Do you think it's just a different story packaged in a different way, a different race back then, uh, or is this just a product of cloning? Like we could obviously go into the cloning aspect of this, and it, do you think it's possible human beings? We're just created from an entity race underground. Well, uh, when you talk about Sumerian history, we have to talk about the Anuna, which is the main subject matter of the Sumerian the Sumerian uh, 
basically belief system. The Babylonians called them Anunnaki, but that's not a correct term. They got that from their Amorite syllabaries and trying to translate these older Sumerian logograms through an Akkadian filter. So Anunnaki, when you hear that, it's not correct. It's the, the actual correct one is the Sumerian Anuna. And, uh, but I mean, I mean, this is a historical mistake and it's been followed by scholars all the way up to the present day. So it doesn't even matter, right. but, uh, but when we're dealing with the histories of ancient Sumer, we have to understand we're talking about a people who preserved histories that, that belong to someone else. Nothing in the Sumerian pantheon histories happened in Sumer, Babylon, Akkad, Elam, that part of the world. Many of the geographic, many of the geographic monikers, the descriptions, things that we find uh, uh, in the Sumerian cuneiform don't match the geographical area. The, the mining cities and metallurgy cities that are mentioned in the Sumerian king list in the in the uh, Pentopolis of Bad Tabira and Shurapak, there's no way those cities were in that part of the world because there's no mining. There's nothing to mine in, in that area where Sumer, Akkad, and, and Babylonia and Assyria are located. In the Tigris Euphrates basin, there are there are no metals. So uh these, these histories of the Anuna and, and this great metallurgical race, they, they were somewhere else bef uh, in, in, before the cataclysm. And this is the deal about Sumerian history. The beginning of Sumerian history begins with Enki arriving on the shores with a, a ship full of men. And when they arrived, later in Babylonia, it was Oannes who arrived on a ship. And because he came from the sea, they, they gave him a fish tail, but he had a human face with a beard. So the Anuna are depicted by the Sumerians as tall, alabaster skinned. They had lapis lazuli eyes, which is a blue semi-precious stone, and they had long flowing beards. The Sumerians themselves could not grow facial hair and they were people of very short stature. So when these original Anuna appeared in their civilization, it was a shock. But many centuries later, a cataclysm occurred, which basically ended the Sumerian culture. But at the very end of Sumerian culture, a new god appeared. For a long period of time, the Sumerians had their pantheon set in stone. You know it, Anu. The trilogy is Anu, Ea, Enki. But they had, this, they had a whole host of gods. But at the very end of Sumerian history, they had to introduce a brand new god. And that was Utu Shamash the sun and this is because sumerian history was under a vapor canopy and only after the day the sky fell the great flood the collapse of the vapor canopy did the sun appear and the sumerians at the very end of their of their their life uh, as a civilization introduced a new god then they fragmented and disappeared into the akkadians the babylonians and the assyrians and the hittites so at the same exact time, the Egyptians also had to do the same thing. The Egyptians had no god for the sun and didn't need one. They had a whole pantheon called the Aeneid, the nine gods. Yep. But at the very end of this period, they had to introduce the son of the sun, which is Horus, the son of Osiris. So they introduced the sun at the exact same time on the other side of the world, the American, ancient American civilizations started their sun calendars. And the first of four sun epics was the water sun. It was the very first. And it's because the sun was born from the vapor canopy. So yes, I have to say yes, that the beginning of Sumerian civilization was underground, not the Sumerians themselves, their surface dwellers, but the Anuna, specifically came from underground. Their first appearance was from a mountain and they descended the mountain, got on ships and they appeared in the Near East. This is exactly what we find in the Enochian record. In the Book of Enoch, the watchers appeared coming down Mount Ardis. And it's the same story, but it's just packaged from a different cultural perspective. Right. Right. Now, it's interesting with the sun. I don't want to get, I want to go back into the alien stuff, but that's interesting with the sun. You're saying it's a water sun and, you know, the Christ is referenced heavily to the sun and Jesus, of course, was baptized in water. That's really fascinating. Maybe that's the correlation there that we could discuss for another time. Let's go back to this underground alien stuff. So like, okay, so the locusts, Revelation 9, the, the you know, the, like I say, the, the Bible is 
is is the greatest spell book ever and what i mean by spell is that it's literature that's being read over and over and people are literally bringing it to life uh and those accounts they're bringing it to life whether or not these are real accounts the ideas that people are speaking are bringing them to life and um the revelation talks about these locusts coming from underground from the bottomless pit and uh, of course there's a star that falls down um <clears throat> from heaven and uh and then the locusts come up do you think that uh because i got it pegged as that man i mean the, the what a what a what a show that would be right what a hollywood movie that would be if that if, if you had these entities coming up from underground and uh you know looking like scorpions as it says um and these are the locusts perhaps and then wrecking havoc on the world and maybe having this massive genocide if you will uh what's your take on that have you done any research into that and correlated and pegged it to the same kind of situation well i think what's being discussed is is definitely some type of staged event where something is staged to fall out of the sky i mean we already have the technology now to holographically yeah. mimics mimic like a capital ship or a drop ship burning in the atmosphere and coming in we, we can do that now so yeah. 20 30 20 30 years from now it's not a departure from anything that can be done now so i can definitely see that in the eschatology it's painting the picture of a staged event something falls from the sky and out of this object pour over some type of some type of subterrestrial army they really come from the deep the, the text the prophetic text is telling us their origin they're coming from the underworld but the thing falling from the sky is telling us what what the surface world is trying to get us to believe is that these invaders are coming from space i don't believe that i believe that they're being prepared in underground facilities even now a like a like a super soldier type race yep. And what's described as locusts are no doubt, no doubt humans. When you read the descriptions, what you're reading is a type of chitinous technological armor that's being fit over over men. You can still see their human faces. This is this is the giveaway that these are humans. Super soldiers been, then. Yeah, they've been retrofitted with all kinds of badass. I mean, when it, to the ancient mind, if they were to see holographically into the future and be told that, hey, man, you're seeing a future event. If they saw humans in chitinous armor that was able to do all kinds of things and give them, make them jump farther, make them stronger, make them go underwater and stuff, it, it, to, the, to them it would be very insect-like. But the choice of the word locust is specific because a locust is not anything but a destroyer of the harvest. Yep. So remember, in the biblical material, the last days is the harvest period. Yep. Everything up until that is the planting season, the growing season, but the last days is the harvest. And it's during the harvest that, I mean, it's during the harvest period that the crop is gonna be destroyed. And this is the avatars. It's time for the immortals within to go, to make their exodus, to leave. And the best way to do that is to destroy their, their, the ability of their avatars to return. And this is gonna be done with, like, like you said, it's gonna be an invasion. They're gonna come up from the underworld. They're not gonna be aliens, but they're gonna be something that was created down there yep. to, to mimic that, but they're gonna be humans. Yep. Uh, so, so it's, that's really, I mean, that's, I resonate with that a lot with all my information. I mean, I, this is why like the Los Alamos and Los Cruces and Area 51 cloning and, and they're making super soldiers. I mean, the, the, you know, they're making humanoids or whatever they're doing down there. They're making them where they'll be in that same kind of parameter that you were talking about coming up and being this, you know, this having this Scorpio skeleton and or whatever you know the armor etc cetera, etc cetera. and i mean it says in revelation in that context from the biblical sense it says that they will only take out those that don't have the seal of god on their forehead right so whatever the hell that means and even if that would like the narrative on the whole the theological aspect is very very challenging to take into consideration and try to interpret that um because that's just one playbook there's so many other playbooks on the world stage if you i mean if you from japan you just know that maybe know the ancient text of shinto which has nothing to do with the bible if you're in the you know in the country of india you're talking about upanishads and that really kind of doesn't have any merit in your life if you're raised in a hindu family or a buddhist family or something like that so right. it's much much different so there's all these constructs playing out at, at simultaneously it's really kind of fascinating are you familiar with the maya 
belief about the end of the Mayan long count. What they said yeah. is going to happen at what the Maya believe is going to happen at the end of the 13th Bacton under the 13 heavens. Now remember, what you're describing is Revelation chapter 13. And in the Mayan concept, we have this, in, in Revelation chapter 13, we have the unfolding of the return of the seven kings of Sumer, the seven kings of the Anunnaki. They returned in the Revelation record just like they were in power right before the cataclysm. The 670 years before the cataclysm, before the great flood, before the day the sky fell, the earth, you know, the sky shattered and all that. There were seven kings. This is a Sumerian prison, prism that describes these seven kings who ruled the Pentopolis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the final city to fall of the dynasty during the reign of the seventh king was Shurapak. And this was the homes, the home city of Napishtim, also known as Atrahasis. We, in Genesis, we called him Noah. This is the, he was born from this same city. And in Revelation, we have the return of the seven kings. They come back to fulfill their destiny that they attempted to do before the flood. And in the Mayans, this is all, this is all explained in Revelation chapter 13. But the Maya said that the end of the Mayan long count, the final Bacton, the 13th Bacton, when it is complete, an invasion of demons from the underworld will scour over the surface. Yeah. This, is a Mayan, this is a Mayan prophecy. Mayan, yeah. I mean, th th there, there's so many ways to kind of break this down, right? Mayan, you go theologically, you go, I mean, there's so many different ways, but the stories are kind of very, very eerily similar. Uh, with what's, and I mean, that goes into the ancient ones, you know, if there is such a thing as the ancient ones being the underground dwellers, could these be the Titans in Tartaria? Could they be the Titans that will be revived to come back up and these being the seven Kings that you mentioned? Well, when you ask if they could be the Titans, we have, we have, it's not linguistics, but we do have a parallel that's very interesting because the word Titan derives from Shaitan. And this word means actually it's been, is used in the Middle East among Arabian and Saracen sources as Satans, devils, jinn, stuff like that. So uh, they're, they're, the further we go back in time, Titan and Shaitan are inter interchangeable. That's basically what I'm saying. And they're both, uh, and they're both, uh, associated to jinn and they're associated to underworld you know dwellings and things like that so i don't know there, there very well could be could be a a correlate there i just really don't know about yeah i i would think so i would think so um so you know you get into these areas area 51 the los alamos you get the los crucius all these underground tunnels all these people seeing sightings the crash the the abductions uh, and then you go into Phil Schneider's account and there being this, I think it's, I don't know how many levels down it goes. Maybe it's 13 levels down or nine levels down. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I was doing some research on that. You just, it's very challenging to figure out what's, what's really the real deal McCoy on that or what's just. Okay. Okay. Forgetting. Let's, let's address that. Okay. I'm telling you right now that it is my opinion and it's my educated opinion right. that the UFO phenomenon is real, the alien abduction phenomenon is sure. real, the underground facilities are real, that there that there is communication and there's not just dialogue, but there's also activity and arrangement between surface governments and whatever's going on in the underworld. That many of these facilities are military run and many of these facilities are breakaway civilization. I'm agreeing with all that, that many military bases have housed materials that have come from the underworld. I'm on board with all that. That yep. UFOs have been documented, photographed, have been seen by the military in the oceans moving around. They have followed them on sonar, radar. Uh, submarines have followed them under water every bit of this is documented i have read many of these accounts i am 100 on board with almost everything that has been reported about all these phenomena the, the the removal of implants and all that my only point of contention is 100 of this entire a ancient alien ufo this whole genre of phenomena 100 of it could be terrestrial and have nothing to do with anything outside our sky because this is this is a deep dive here you're going to be really hard put to find any evidence of ufo activity of anything being seen going in and out our atmosphere 
because about 99.9% .9 of all UFO sightings by military and civilians is always objects coming in and out of bodies of water or valleys and mountains. Not or coming they, or in. They just, or they just, they just kick stones and they're gone in the sky, you know, like they just, they're gone. They're, they're so quick, but then yeah. it's not like they, they, you can't follow it. So yeah, well, I mean, I definitely can see what you're saying about yeah. you know nothing going outside well well I, well yeah not only that but but many of the sightings that shows them they they lower into bodies of water they right. submerge into mm -hmm. water yep. or they submerge into the sides of mountains or what appear to be the sides of mountains and this isn't yeah. normal this isn't normal if right. these things were really from space and coming from other star systems and all that which i don't believe then we would have a lot more we would have a lot more information on that. You wouldn't be able to hide that. There would be too many eye eyewitnesses. I mean, these things have been seen hovering and flying through the sky for for hours on end sometime, but they don't go in and out the atmosphere. They go in and out the ground and the yeah. ocean. Yeah. So, you know, you get into this whole aspect of the, the I mean, you, you know, a big guy that comes to mind, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Greer, big UFO proponent. Um, I mean, you know, like kind of, you know, he kind of looks like an alien if you, if you look at his face it's really interesting right um i don't know i don't the guy i mean i don't i don't I know much about his him. work but huh i don't really know know much about him i just uh, uh oh. one of the biggest ufo researchers probably on the planet uh yeah massive huge and they of course they have so many documented cases but again you know they only can document what they see in the sky but they can't tell you where it goes Right. I mean, that so, I see. I mean, that definitely the accounts that you're talking about are going in under the water, in mountains, through mountains, under the ground, in valleys, in caves. Um, but then if they're in the sky, they just disappear. But you can't say what you're not. At, you're not up in the atmosphere. You're not up in the stratosphere uh, right. with weather balloons sitting up there watching, seeing exactly the activity going on up there. You know? Yeah. So, so without that documentation, it's all speculation. Yeah, it's it's one hundred percent. I mean, like I said, I'm I'm on board with everything that's reported. I people, I I take people at face value. If you say you experience an anomaly, yeah. and and there's some evidence for it, and it's really changed the dynamic of your life, your behavior, and all that, I'm going to believe you. And when I see hundreds of accounts spread through four or five books, and I get I pretty much get a gist that okay, this is a real phenomenon. I can go ahead and accept this at face value, and. But there's nothing in any of these accounts that prove anything is coming from space. Yeah. It, it's still all terrestrial or subterrestrial, and that's that's the only that's the only that's the only position that I want to I want to take because it seems to me that if the if if the powers that be are allowing Hollywood and Bollywood and all these producers to put out all these movies on alien invasions and all and they're so successful and they get so much media attention that's a that's a red flag for me if the media so willingly promotes something then it's probably not true so and this is something that i have to take i have to take into consideration that the world if something is really true the media is going to avoid it like the plague it's just though our world reports the exact opposite of the truth all the time. So it really, it really baffles me sometimes mm -hmm. when people are so willing to believe certain concepts that are promoted so loudly by the establishment, by Scientifica, by by the media, and they never second think, they never second guess these things. And it it really troubles me sometimes that people who believe they're actually scientific are only demonstrating a deeper level of faith than Christians even have that Jesus ever walked. It's pure faith that you accept that these scientists 10 years ago established this based off mathematical constructs of scientists from the 1950s, based off extrapolations of, of discoveries and, and observations from 1910s. Almost every single thing that we accept as true that's reported by science actually falls apart with greater scrutiny. And yet people have faith that all this is real, but they don't consider it faith because it's supposed to be science right so trusted yeah, science it's crazy <laughs> trusted yeah. science so i guess we can cut let me see what time is it here uh we got a little over an hour um 
I guess I want I want to kind of go into this. This is really interesting. I want to get your take on this. And this this is all about maybe, you know, these underground underground entities coming up. And I mean, uh, if if something like that were to happen, some kind of invasion, that would literally uh, shatter a lot of people's paradigms. It would it would change humanity in the biggest way for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. And what would what would be the agenda for that to happen? Uh, there's so many different branches we could go off topic wise. But what I wanted to get into is, you know, because I'm a futurist, man. I'm looking at like what's coming down the pike for humanity as a whole. And you know, you know how I roll, man. I, I'm big into astrology, and right. uh, and and the ages r- ruling over this reality. And I've kind of got it pegged to where, you know, like if you look at um, the age of Pisces, of course, that's a water sign and it's ruled by Neptune, co-hosted by Jupiter. And this is supposedly going to be tied into the mud floods and maybe the last reset we had. And of course, Pisces being tied to water. Now you're moving into the age of Aquarius, which is an air sign. And the ruler is Uranus, which is a planet of electricity and across the way, that is ruling over Leo, its co-host, if you will, is going to be the sun, they're going to need the involvement of the sun. So you literally have the sun and Uranus and theologically speaking, it talks a lot about which I've broken down of the kingdom that is going to be set up, which in my opinion, the kingdom of the Christ is going to be the kingdom of, of Aquarius. Uh, and it's going to perhaps do away with the sun. Um, and you had talked about the vapor canopy and, and and maybe it coming back or something like that but you know i'm looking at i'm looking at the way technology is going at th- this point and what they're doing right now what they have been doing is they're making lab grown meat they're making m- meat out of a petri dish why are they doing that now a lot of people say well they're saving and they're going to save animals they're going to end cruelty to animals i i can get that right because you're moving into perhaps the age of aquarius which definitely could be a, a big time just uh, the age of justice you're getting all this child trafficking coming to, to coming to light and i i can see all that point and this is the age of the christ but is it possible that the reason why they're grow they're making this lab grown meat and they're trying to get this because animals will literally be wiped out is that you think that's a possibility with this whole reset coming up on the big event and the phoenix event you talk about in 2041 um vapor canopy is going to have a complete opposite effect from that because uh the last time we had a a vapor canopy the animals grew to huge sizes they became so prolific that we had to build cities like Catalhoyuk and gobeki tipi and jericho that had gigantic walls just to keep these creatures out oh yeah it was totally different atmospheric pressure a lot of oxygen uh, plants grew huge mushrooms 14 feet tall yeah trees were gigantic and it it happened in a very short period of time ambient radiation from multiple volcano volcanic venting uh increased this just like in 1902 on my channel i've explained that two scientists and uh i have the book right here I have I have I have a hardback book from 1902 right here where it talks about these two scientists in 1902 who grew two inches. One of them was 58 years old. The other one was 62 or 63 years old. And in six months of exposure after a volcano that killed 30,000 people at uh, that Martinique in 1902 in the month of May, six months of exposure to that volcanic venting, both of these men grew two inches. So you can imagine how big things would grow when the vapor canopy world lasted 1,656 years, according to Genesis. So, right. uh, hey, I want to read this to you, man. This is not a, you, you said something really interesting about coming up from the underworld and all that. Listen, are you familiar? This book right here was published in like 2009 or something. It's a book. It's one of my books on 2040 and 2046. Oh, 2012. This book was published in 2012 by Book Tree. And in this book, I cited Mother Shipton's 530 year old prophecy. Can I read this section to you about the underworld? Absolutely. Go ahead. This is Mother Shipton's 500 year old prophecy. Let's see. There's a couple places. All right. This is after the 2040, because she says 100 years after a world war, the sky dragon will return. It's the sixth sky dragon. 
and it'll return and wreak all kinds of devastation. This lines up to the sixth seal of the book of Revelation. This is the return of the Phoenix. The Phoenix is the sky dragon, and she's talking about it. This is May 2040 when it's destroyed, but she says that the sky dragon is gonna double back and come back almost immediately. And this is what she says. Oh, let's see. And when the dragon's tail is gone, man forgets and smiles and carried on to apply himself too late, too late, for mankind has earned deserved fate. His masked smile, his false grandeur will serve will serve the gods their anger stir, and they will send the dragon back to light the sky. His tail will crack upon the earth and rend the earth, and man shall flee, lord and surf. But slowly they are routed out to seek diminishing water spout, and men will die of thirst before the oceans rise to mount the shore, and lands will crack and rend anew. You think it's strange, it will come true. And in some far off distant land, some men of such a tiny band will have to leave their solid mount and span the earth, those few to count, who survives this and then begin the human race again, but not on land already there, but on ocean beds stark dry and bare. So uh, this this she's talking about survivors who were protected from this cataclysm she just said it's a small band of men that exit their mountain and then they this is the exact same thing that that started the whole sumerian history with the appearance of enki and the anuna a small band of men exited a mountain and then went out into the the post cataclysmic world and she's saying that this is going to happen in the future so uh that's that's the first part. It goes on just a little bit more. Let's see. You don't mind me continuing? Oh, please go ahead. Okay, so, oh, uh, yeah. I, this was uh, I found this in like 2007, and I had it published in this book in 2012. So it's like what eight, nine, ten, eleven. It's like eleven, almost twelve years ago. So let's see. Okay. Uh, not every soul on earth will die as the dragon's tail goes sweeping by. Not every land on earth will sink, but these will wallow in stench and stink of rotting bodies of beasts and man, of vegetation crisped on land. But the land that rises from the sea will be dry and clean and soft and free of mankind's dirt and therefore be the source of man's new dynasty. And those that live will ever fear the dragon's tail for many years. But time erases memory. You think it's strange, but it will be. And before the race is built anew, a silver serpent comes to view and spews out men of like unknown to mingle with the earth now grown, cold from its heat. And these men can enlighten the minds of future man to intermingle and show them how to live in love and thus endow the children with the second sight a natural thing so that they might grow graceful, humble, and when they do, the golden age will start anew. The dragon's tail is but a sign for mankind, mankind's fall and man's decline. And before this prophecy is done, I shall be burned at the stake at one. My body singed and my soul set free. You think I utter blasphemy. You're wrong. These things have come to me. This prophecy will come to be. This 530 year old prophecy of Mother Shipton. What was so, her name? Mother Shipton. Her name is Earthless South Hill. And uh, she's real popular in the UK. But Mother Shipton, uh, she has a cave that a lot of people, a lot of people visit Mother Shipton's cave. Uh -huh. But uh, I did a, I did a, I did a, a dissertation on Mother Shipton's prophecy because there were, there, it had, there are detractors who say it's a forgery, but that's only partially true. In the 1800s, some asshole turned around and added a bunch of material uh, to a, uh, I'm sorry about that, man. But somebody, oh, I love it, dude. I just be raw, bro. Yeah. Hey, listen, some <laughs> ass introduced a whole bunch of things that were fulfilled in the 1800s trying to show other people, look, Mother Shipton predicted all this, but it's not true. Mother Shipton's prophecy was only for the last days. It didn't have anything to do with the 1800s, like trains and submarines and airplanes, all in Zeppelins, all that shitty. It was all added. 
it's easy to see the the interpolated uh, parts of the text and the true parts, which are only about the last days. Yep. So she literally said that a century after a world war steep deep in blood, that the fur that the sky dragon would return. This is 2040, Phoenix. Now, she also said that almost immediately the gods would send the sky dragon back. This is 2046. This is the end of the Mayan long count, the 13th Bacton. 1,872,000 days from the start of the long count in 3113 BC. So, this uh, all this chronology la adds up perfectly to, to Revelation chapter 13, the return of the seven kings. These seven kings in the Necronomicon and in many occult writings from the 1880s like Charles Burgoyne, these occult writings call the seven kings the ancient ones. This is their actual title in, in occult literature. There you go, and, man. And a lot of people, a lot of people think that the Necronomicon is only a work of fiction. And I've had to deal with this when I, because I have a video on the Necronomicon and I'm showing people, you don't know what you're talking about. This guy who introduced the Necronomicon as fiction actually used the actual real translations of Sumerian and Akkadian cuneiform text, among them the Enema Elish, and put them all through his text and released these occult truths as fiction when they're not. They're very ancient records about the return of the ancient ones and how they're going to open a gate called Yaksakak. And when they open that gate, the seven ancient ones will be able to come into our world and, and take on physical avatars and rule among men. It's called the beast kingdom of Revelation chapter 13. Yeah, and you get 13 verses 18, right? So totally get that. I mean, so, I mean, the ancient ones, do you think they could be coming from underground though? 100%. Yeah, there's a the traditions also give us misinformation. They want us to see these things as being in the sky, yeah. because in, in the occult traditions, the seven kings are are imprisoned in an object called the dark satellite. This was this was published in 1882 and 1883 by Charles Burgoyne in a book called Light of Ancient Egypt. Yeah, I have the I, book. I have his part one and two, right? It's got two parts. Yes, yes, it's volume one and volume two. You're right. It's a very extensive work. Charles Burgoyne his writing check this out let me put it to you this way if you read volume one and volume two of charles burgoyne's material he is dead on accurate on astrology on on numismatics on on uh, palmistry on all the occult traditions uh the tarot everything he's writing he's dead on accurate about so why should we disbelieve him when he says when he says that the, the seven kings, the ancient ones, will be returning to rule on earth once more. Why? Why, why should we disbelieve him? He was a master at ancient occult studies. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and, then to find, and then to find the same thing uh, uh, mentioned in the, in the Necronomicon is really interesting because it's fiction, supposedly. But it, it cites all these real texts that scholars have actually found and translated. And, and, and it also... Uh, mirrors the testimony of the Mad Arab, which is ancient occult Arabic literature. So, yeah, man, it's 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 just like Hollywood today. Truth, yeah. truth in movies. I yeah. mean, this is this is something a lot of people on YouTube do. J Dreamers does it. Truth in movies. I mean, it's no different. It's in the 1800s and early 20th 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 century they were releasing tr truth in fiction. So it's no yeah. different. Oh, big oh, big shout out to Santos Bonacci because I mean he, he's he's who got me interested in, in Charles Burgoyne books, uh, and I I got both of them and I was pr pretty pretty uh, pretty happy with what I read. So I got I got to re I got to pull those back out again because I haven't read. Yeah, them well, if you if years. you like listen, if you like Charles Burgoyne, heck yeah, I I, I can give you I can give you uh I can send you the two PDFs for something even better and it's oh, really yeah. hard it's really hard for me to say this but there is a volume one and volume two of an even better occult book it is magnificent well, it's I'm called it's called the it's called the magus and it was published in 1801 it's volume one and volume two it's a compilation of many many ancient occult writers and the book will floor you you will have decodes oh. to do for the rest of your life just going through its charts and stuff well i love the day 1801 that's the 181 42nd prime number so i'm all over that definitely i'm gonna rub, i'm gonna send you an email and request that please me. remind me in an email Magus. and i'll give you it's the pdf Magus. It's called so the Magus, called uh, Volume One and Volume Two. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a part of my PDF library. 
Uh, I sell a PDF library in, in thumb drives because uh, this library here is only about 500 books now, 520 something books from the 1800s. And I got eight books from the 1700s. And my other library has over 100 books, but they're all modern research type books. But my PDF library of old books is 7,147 texts. And I'll never be able to read that, but I'll be doing videos. Say the, the number again. What's life. the number again? 7,000 what? So I, oh, I've sold many of them, but it's 7,147 PDFs of old books. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because the 7147, those of you that know my research, what is the 714 related to? Anyway, that's for fun. That's for fun. Um, amazing, amazing content. Uh, hey, I wanted to ask you, when's the next time you're going to be doing a, um, a get together uh, for with, with people? Maybe Shoot, I'll, I don't maybe know. I'll I, maybe I'll come out to Texas well, and join well, you. I've got, I've got all. Martin Leakey, Martin Leakey and Max Egan have said they're going to join me when I do, when I when I do one in San Diego oh. here in about here in about 2 months. So oh, okay. if you'd like to, if you'd like to join, I can arrange, I can arrange airfare, I can arrange you to get down there and, and join us, man, if you want to if you want to come to that because it's been it's getting put together now. Where, whereabouts in San Diego are you doing a hotel or Yeah, well, yeah, well, people will get put up in a hotel, but but uh we're actually doing the meetup at, at a venue. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I love San Diego. I got, I got a whole bunch of friends there, so uh, oh, I would, yeah. loved it. Was she going to do that in September? Uh, I believe it's going to be early October. Is October. When I, early October. Yeah, I'm not okay. really sure. I, I'll get the details because uh, it was it was actually people in San Diego that wanted. They were upset that I've been to San Diego twice this year, and <laughs> I never gave any, any. And all I did was go to the bookstore. And I did a live video telling, hey, you guys want to meet me? I'm down here now. Come on. And it wasn't giving people enough time. Yeah. So so they want me to, they want me to come back. But I said, look, if I'm going to come back, I'm going to go ahead and bring friends. So I, I asked Matt, I asked Max if he'd come. Max Egan said, yeah, I'll go. I, I'll attend that. And Martin Leakey said he'll come from the UK to attend that, too. So if nice. you and, and uh, I don't even care, you know, Jordan Waters above or anybody else, you know, wants to come. We we'll just turn it into a big old a big old live video fest and we'll have cameras everywhere. Oh, dude, I can get a I, you, I can probably get my friend to come down. She's a professional videographer. And do like really the real McCoy on getting it professionally done. Uh, yeah, microphones. I mean, camera pictures, B-roll footage. I mean, she does. She's amazing. So. Just, yeah. well, I'll talk to you more about it. I'm definitely count me in. I'm definitely down for that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm cool with that too, man. It's it's uh, we can turn that into a, into some fun. Yeah, man, that, that's you definitely know? my cup of tea there. Uh, all right, well, awesome. I think I think we we, I mean, hour almost an hour and a half. I think that's pretty good. Uh, people's attention span. I know everybody's gonna 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 have a, a large viewing on this, and I know probably most of the people will make it all the way through to the end. But that's pretty much it. I mean, you know, from from I mean. Back in the day, you probably watched this show called The Land of the Lost, and you had the Slee Stacks that were living mm -hmm. underground to H.G. Wells and the Time Machine, yep. talking about yep. the ancient ones living underground. I mean, yep. these things are all now starting to come out, and I think, you know, then I know you're on board this. I think we're going to finally see it. Yeah, well, I, I, I will make a note that's very interesting to me, is that... The things I believe that are false are the things that are most widely promoted by the media, and by the establishment, and by the government, such as the extraterrestrial phenomenon. I believe all these things are happening, and I believe in the underground civilization. I believe the idea abductions, like I said. But the very fact that it's so heavily promoted by the establishment make, makes me makes me even more stringent in my belief that it's all false, and that while these things are true and they are happening, somebody else is the culprit. So this leads me to what you just said about the reptilians, about the, the deal. Now, I understand David Icke came out real strong 25 years ago talking about the reptilians and all that stuff. I get all that. My problem is, and it's not really a problem, it's just something that I have to mention because I, I, don't, I don't like to practice exclusions. I want to, I want to say opposing evidence as well. And that's the fact that I can't find any sources in any ancient texts that actually talk about shape changing humans that shape changed into into uh, uh, repti reptiles, except for one reference in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a reference of a reptilian human uh, re or, or humans having to deal with a reptilian race. 
I'm not talking about little metaphors and allegories like when a serpent is speaking and all that. You know, this we understand why the Egyptians had the cobra on here. It, this was the omenologist. This was the speaker of secrets. This is why the serpent was used, was used in the Genesis text, tell it, telling us it wasn't a real serpent because serpent means one who interprets. It's nahash. It means one who interprets in Hebrew. This was somebody who knew divine secrets and was telling humans, ordinary humans, that the gods were lying to them so i'm a uh i'm just i find it very unusual that i can't find all these references and that itself is another dead giveaway the very fact that the historical record record has been so completely scrubbed from any references to reptilians is a red flag for me too yeah so well, i mean you just me, you would just chalk it up to under, underground entities. I mean, you you call it whatever you want. I mean, the no, no, I think no, no, Logan. I think you missed my point. Oh, uh, my point, my point is, is I would be willing to entertain David Ike that he's right that these these people we think are humans right. are actually shape changers, and they, because we can't find them in all these controlled libraries that we have. All these controlled releases of libraries and text, and, and we get all these different versions after these 138 year of Phoenix episodes. To me, to me, if something wasn't real, I would find a lot more evidence of it. You understand? Oh, it's no, like totally. The, it's like the Phoenix phenomenon. You have any idea of the prodigious amount of data I have had to pour through just to put this together because. The Phoenix phenomenon has been scrubbed from almost every, everywhere. I only find bits and pieces and fragments, and yet I was still able to put all this together, but it took over two decades. But when it comes to the reptilian aspect that's so widely uh, popularized today, it's not in the historical record. Therefore, I'm, I'm more inclined to believe it may be a real thing because like the Phoenix phenomenon, somebody's been editing our texts. Yep. Somebody's been editing out information so want to be found find it. Yeah. And only in these last days have we come into contact with so much information that even the elite in the establishment haven't been able to tightly control the flood of data. Just like the prophecy in the Old Testament says in the book of Daniel, it says in the last days, knowledge shall be be increased so i mean uh you know you know that southern baptist programming is still in me brother it still comes out <laughs> uh, dude i'm in doctor i still have the programming as well i i'm a huge fan of all the ancient texts man it doesn't matter what it is i mean they're, like, to me it's just all the show anyway and just i just tell people enjoy the ride because it's all you really can do just kind of enjoy the ride and go along with what you can and all that kind of fun stuff um so i guess we'll just leave it at that man you know it's just so fascinating to the day I, I, I never plan, I, ne I don't look at the calendar and I'm like, okay, look up what day it is. And then I then I go back when I plan these, then I look back and I like I just did a podcast with Jordan. I did it at my midnight, I started at midnight because he's over in Europe. And so he it was his morning, but I started on July 7th. Today is that 777 day, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And then here I am and doing it with you and him and I, we didn't plan ours. It was last minute. He was like, Hey, you want to, you want to do one? And we've done this so many times, but then back to back, like I did one early this morning at midnight. And then here I am, you know, starting with you today on seven, seven, seven. And it's just so the, the dates with that dude, I mean, I don't want to get into decoding right now, but it's just completely mesmerizing to me with, with everything here. So, um, so I'm looking forward to seeing what unfolds in 2024. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? You got me curious. So I'm probably going to have to take take a couple of days out of my life to sit here and just do a deep dive on it, applying, applying my new understanding of wave diffusion. But I think I can do it. I, I need to do some work with Square Peg Divergent because she has literally picked up the torch where I left off and has been doing predictions analysis like you wouldn't believe. And I really need to give her credit for that. I've just been so busy. Yeah, you know, I... I... I really would love to come out and sit with you for a day and learn the um, the charts and the diagrams and the methodology that you utilize and then take that back and implement and overlay all the bits and pieces that I have 
kind of like putting an engine together. And I think there would be something to that. Jordan was asking me to do some, some looking at the astrology maps for all the crashes, 1929. And then mm -hmm. on all these dates that you're talking about, the Phoenix phenomenon, every, the 56, of course, was really big. You were saying history repeats itself every 56 years or something like that. It was yeah. like when you talked <clears throat> about the Empire State Building uh, getting hit and then 56 years later, something else happening. I think I, if I remember that correctly, you were- Well, you, well you do know the, 56 is a very prominent number because mm. it is it is literally eight sevens seven is a cycle you understand eight eight is a very interesting number it turns sideways it's the infinity number but it when it comes to eight you have one two three four five six seven and then one of the next series of seven is actually your number eight eight in the old occult systems is the number for new beginnings seven is the number for a closed system a completed cycle so when you get to 56 you have two different concepts that now marry each other and that is and that is a closed cycle seven sevens is completely done and a whole new beginning emerges which means you now can go in any direction eight literally infers that the past is no longer a precedent it's a whole new reality tunnel so it's a yeah we can do that sometime if, I yeah mean, uh, man that's i mean the, the whole the i believe whole, in the i believe in the marrying of systems and for you know, sure. uh, uh if 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 gematria can add to calendrical isometrics or other way around and we could build a stronger predictive analysis using that then yeah i would i would i would really like to look into that and uh because one of the one of the chief characteristics of my office algorithm is basically re restructuring our sequencing of calendrical events into the old sumerian sexagesimal system this isn't done today but it has great predictive value let me explain the sure. year now is 365.25 days, but it wasn't in the ancient world when all these calendars were developed. And fit, like, I'll give you an example, 56 years. 56 years under the 360 day original year is not the same as 56 years under the 365.25 day year. And do you want to know the difference, how big of a disparity this is and how it would completely alter the, the, the basically any anything in predictive anal analytics, it would totally alter it because they're right. so different. Let sure. me show you just real quick before we close. Yeah, three hundred and sixty-five point two five times fifty-six years. I'm just using fifty-six. Is twenty thousand four hundred and fifty-four days. Now, remember that number twenty thousand four fifty-four. Never mind, you didn't have to remember it. Now, 56 years of the divine year system, the old system of 360 days, which was known to the ancient Hebrews, Egyptians, the Olmecs, the Zapotecs, the Quiche, the Amorites. It was the old Akkadian. It was the old Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Elamite, Chinese. Everybody went by a 360 day year. Perfect circle. Now, yep, perfect circle, 360 degrees. It's 20,160 days. So the difference between these is 294 days. That's a lot. That's, and that's by adding in 56 years, you add 5.25. So here we have two different systems. And the reason it, predictions are off so many times is because people are applying 365.25 to their pr predictive analytics and it doesn't work. This is a corrupted system. It corrupts everything. You got to go back to the original system to get your predictions right. I can show you how to do all this with the clinical isometrics. It's fascinating. But yeah, that's a huge difference. Both of them are 56 years. Well, you would, you, yeah, but I've, I've toyed with this because if you play around with the 365, you have the 52 weeks. If you go to 360, you actually move it to 45. So you end yes. up get to a different week system. Uh, and I played around with this quite a bit. Uh, it's really, I haven't done it in a long time, but I know it goes from 52 to 45 with the 360. Yeah, it, yeah it's all, uh, it, the whole thing is, is really interesting. I would be curious how the material would, would, would be applied to these or even astrology. Because 
oh, uh, this is a project you and I might, might want to work on. I can do yeah. a bunch of I can do a bunch of uh, clinical isometric predictions and lay them out in chart form and yeah. send them and send them to you. I would love to do you, that, man. And you would look and you could look up the astrological associations and and get back to me on that. And uh, then, I definitely. Uh, I, I mean, if you just straight up numerology, the 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 a big book in in Gnostic, if you want to consider it not the, the law of one, right? Raw material. Well, the right. law of one, the law and the law of one in numerology is fifty six. It equals really? the number fifty six. Yeah, it equals the number fifty six, which is and that whole that's all you go into Mac, Max Planck and him talking about. I don't know if you've done a lot of research in Max Planck's work, but him talking about like everything's one mind. Right, and yeah. this would, then you get into law one, which is just one mind. Well, if it's fifty six, well, the words lights, camera, action equals fifty six, which is the movie that we're living in. Because I think we're living inside of a movie. Speed of light yeah. is fifty six. Spirit yeah. into matter is fifty six. These are all fifty sixes, man. All right. Well, the Planck, the Planck constant, is, is basically the only the only real. The Planck constant is the only thing we real we have to measure against non locality and non the very existence of quantum non-locality and how it applies to human consciousness is my is, is what convinces me that we are living in a script that convinces yep. me that we're living in a in a interactive movie but it's one it's a medium by which we have great uh power to basically navigate who we are and where what we're doing and our coordinates through this medium uh, i believe that we have a lot more power to to do that so this is this is a subject matter for another video, but but for right now you need to send me an email on the on the uh, on the Magus Volume One and Volume yeah, Two. Yeah, I want to dive. I, I, how, how, how long? How big? How big? Uh, how big of volumes are there? How many pages? So, same size, but they're packed with more data than okay. than Charles Burgoyne. Cool. Uh, and they got they got some amazing occult tables and charts and diagrams. Beautiful. And then, uh, and you got to understand, this is 1801, but all his sources are from the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. He's citing all the old grimoires and all that. Wow. So, um, let's see. That, and yeah, we need to initiate that project on predictions and try to marry the systems and see if we can't get more output. I think I think it would be a great, great thing to, to, to take on. I'm totally down for that. Um, to step away maybe from the typical de decoding I've been doing. I, I got so much of that already established. I think maybe changing it up and, and maybe focusing on that would be something I'd love to entertain. So I'll definitely be on top of you for that. That'll work. Yeah, man. Cool. All right, brother. Well, it's a wrap, man. Under Let's talk about underground aliens or underground entities, whatever. It's been a fun journey. Thanks for all your knowledge, your expertise. I think we covered a lot of data. I think a lot of people that are watching this will be very satisfied with the material that we presented here. Maybe we can dive into this a little bit further in part two or get into something else. Uh, you always bring so much great knowledge to the table. So I'm Thank very you. grateful for uh, for your time, my friend. Really, it's, been, it's an honor and a pleasure. So appreciate it. Hey, the 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 other night, oh, uh, I watched what was that? The Adjustment Bureau. Have you ever oh, seen great, it? 2011. Great, 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 movie. great movie. I, I recommend people to watch that to have a better grasp of how our reality actually operates. The Men in Black are real. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you were mentioned just one last thing. You were mentioning uh, 2012, right? You were saying how the you were talking about the Mayan long count and all this stuff. You know, it's so interesting because in temperature. 212 degrees is sublimation of water okay it goes from what it goes from a liquid right to a gas hmm all right which is 2012 there's a lot of i mean prometheus came out in 2012 ridley scott's movie there's some interesting have you seen prometheus have you watched that movie i don't think i've seen that one no oh man it's pretty interesting there's a lot there's of a stuff that, that that prometheus is tied to i mean we didn't talk about this but definitely I think it's tied to the underground entities, uh, Pluto, the underworld, uh, tied to Prometheus, absolutely. And there is that possibility, I'm gonna leave this here, there is that possibility that mankind was created from underground and that's it, that's how we got here. But I know a lot of people will probably not like that part, but again, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying it's absolute, I'm saying it's a possibility to take into consideration, so. Well, okay, so <laughs> we can wrap up with this right here. It could be possible that our origin is the underworld, that we actually came from the deep, yep. like the ancient Sumerian texts came from, and that we are the descendants of the very Anuna that we read about in the text who came from the deep. Yep. Now, 
It could be that the different races that have been left and abandoned on the surface world are the descendants of former avatars that we had manufactured in the underworld to survive whatever biosphere existed on the surface at the time. Mm -hmm. We've lived in temperate worlds, desert worlds, tundra worlds, vapor canopy worlds, and, and now the world we have today, this is temperate. But we have lived in different biospheres and each race may be the residual genetic echoes, the descendants of those, of those abandoned races as we struggled to adapt. And sometimes we just have to abduct some of our brothers and sisters who can so easily survive on the surface so we in the underworld can make the genetic adaptations that we can so we can create future avatars that can, sur can survive similar conditions i'm not saying this is what's happening i'm just saying that this is a distinct possibility yeah well, i mean i'll leave you with this right so when the human being is produced in the womb when it starts to grow the very first thing that starts to grow is the is the anus <laughs> so you could say we're all assholes right so if you think yeah. about that the anus is the bottom of you which if you're mm -hmm. standing it's the bottom so it represents the ground right it's the bottom and that's the first thing that's formed in the embryo in the womb is is the asshole. <laughs> so I can say wow. we're all assholes. <laughs> wow. That's a hell of a closing statement. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For fun, ladies and gentlemen. But that's 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 a fact. You know, the, the anus is the first thing that's formed. So maybe that's a reference to well, this is where we came from. We came from the underworld. So all right, ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. For Decoder Reality, Logan, Jason, Archaics, always a pleasure, my friend. I appreciate all your time and energy. Look forward to San Diego for sure. You can count me in on that, man. I'll talk to you more about that awesome. uh, off topic, uh, off camera. All right, brother. Take care, man. Much love. All right. Later. <laughs>